This evening, uh, our, basically our text is Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. But rather than just reading that one verse, which I just did, um, I would like to read a, um, a parable that our Lord gave about showing forgiveness. And that is found in Matthew chapter 18. I'm sure we're all very familiar with it. Uh, Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 21 through verse 35. And Jesus gives it an answer to a question that Peter asked because he really wanted to know, Lord, how often do I need to forgive those who sin against me? And basically we're going to see that there isn't any limit to that forgiveness even as the Lord has basically given us unlimited forgiveness. In verse 21 we read, Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. So the slaves fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii and he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Now I do want you to see that what Jesus is saying here is exactly the same thing he said in the Sermon on the Mount. If you forgive others their trespasses, their debts, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you will, do not forgive, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. We have all been given or been forgiven <laughs> an infinite debt. We're like the servant who was forgiven the 10,000 talents, something which he never could have repaid sell the wife, sell the children, sell all his possessions. You, you put a, maybe a small scratch in the debt, but don't come anywhere near it. There's no way he could have paid it off, just as there's no way we could have ever paid off the debt we had to God's justice. But when he pleaded for mercy, the Lord shows him mercy. But then he refuses to show mercy to his fellow servant whose debts to him were much, much less. Uh, insignificant really compared to what he had just been forgiven and he refuses to forgive. And so his Lord says, well, I'm not going to forgive you either and throws him into prison or basically this same thing the Lord is telling us. We must forgive others. If we've been forgiven, we will forgive others. That will be our character. That is what the Spirit of God will do inside of us. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. Now again, this is a part of a series that we began to look at last week. Um, we want to look at those virtues that the Lord particularly says He delights in. Those virtues that, uh, that those possessed whom the Lord was pleased to use, those whom He called His friends, uh, those that He moved, as it were, into His inner circle. Um, being close to the Lord doesn't merely have to do with election, as we were looking at before, but with how earnestly we're seeking to grow 
in those holy characteristics that God loves. Now again, what we're talking about here moves beyond merely doing what God commands or avoiding what it is he forbids to becoming someone who is pleasing to him, the kind of person whom he really loves, someone who is more like his son, the Lord Jesus, whom he loves most of all because he reflects that perfect image of God. Now, if you have his spirit, this is what the spirit of God is actually doing in you. If you have his spirit, this is what you already want to become. And if you will just yield to the spirit of God, if you will follow where he is leading you, this is what he will make you. Now, the first, first virtue we looked at was humility. And again, let me just remind you, humility is the opposite of pride. Nehemiah Rogers wrote, humility is the repentance of pride. You know, it's just as Paul said on one occasion, let the thief who steals steal no longer, but let him work and give. We'd say working and giving is the repentance of stealing. Well, humility is the repentance of pride. It's just the opposite in every way. Bernard of Clairvaux called it self-annihilation. Uh, we s destroy self, we destroy ego, as it were. We humble ourselves uh, and become what it is the Lord wants us to become, which is a servant and those who are willing to forgive. Why should we want to be humble? Well, again, it's one of those virtues that God delights in because, as James tells us, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Pride is, is not something we should take pride in. You know, we've heard people talk about how pride, you know, proud they are of their pride. I'm a prideful person, and they sort of pat themselves on the back. Pride is obnoxious to God. God hates pride. But humility is something he desires. The world doesn't desire that. The world looks down on people who are humble, but not so with God. He loves humility. He desires humility because if you will humble yourself, God says he will bless you. In James 4.10, humble yourself in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. God blesses those who are humble. He exalts those who are humble. And he resists those who are prideful. Again, Jesus says in Matthew 5.3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now again, I wanted to emphasize that because as we go through this series, we are going to have to see that humility is essential to virtually all the characteristics the Lord finds precious and wants us to cultivate. If you are unwilling to humble yourself, you are not going to be able to become the man or woman or youth or child that God wants you to be, which is why God places such a high value on humility. Now, the second virtue that we want to consider this evening uh, is mercy. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now, we saw this morning that God, actually we read that in our call to worship in Psalm 145, that God is a God of mercy, that he delights to show mercy, particularly to those who will turn from their sins and trust in his son. There is nothing he is unwilling to forgive if we will do that. Now, one thing we didn't note this morning is something else we just read about in this psalm, and that is that God's mercy is not reserved just for those who repent and trust in His Son. There is a certain sense in which His mercy extends to His whole creation, even to those who haven't repented. God is gracious even to the wicked. The only reason that those in this world who haven't turned from their sins and trusted in Jesus are not in hell right at this moment the only reason why they're still alive and, and in this world is because God is merciful. And by the way, that's the only reason why you and I survived to the point where we actually saw God's grace in the Lord Jesus Christ, why he didn't wipe us out as soon as we were born into the world. It's because God is merciful to sinners. He's merciful to, to all. But now that we have received his grace, now that we have received his mercy, God wants us to be merciful as well. As those who have received mercy, he wants us to show mercy. Blessed are the merciful. 
So tonight, let's consider three things. First of all, the Lord's call to us to be merciful. Secondly, what it means to be merciful. And then thirdly, what the Lord promises if we will show mercy to others. Now, first of all, let's consider that the Lord calls us to be merciful. And again, we might ask the question, why? And the main reason is, again, because God wants us to be like Him. He wants us to reflect His image, and He, among other things, is merciful. It's actually a part of a larger you know, category or rubric that we might call holiness. We, we should call holiness. Holiness, remember, is a perfect love, or it is a love for that which is perfect, for that which is good, for that which is morally pure and right. And that is what the Lord wants us to be. That's what he wants us to put on. Peter writes in 1 Peter 1, verses 15 and 16, But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. God wants us to be holy, because that is what he is. God wants us to be holy, because that is what pleases him when he sees his image, that moral uprightness, that purity. Because God intends eventually to bring us to heaven, and we cannot go to heaven unless we are holy. Uh, Habakkuk writes in, in Hab well, Habakkuk 1.13, Your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. That's why the Lord sent his Son into the world, was that we might be holy, that Jesus through his work might give us the Holy Spirit, might send him back into our hearts to make us uh, to be holy, again, not just positionally holy and perfect in his sight, but also practically holy, that we might become like Jesus Christ. Well, just how holy are we supposed to be? Well, again, the Lord says, you shall be holy, for I am holy. He doesn't mean just become a little bit holy. He wants us to be as holy as he is. He wants us to love what is good in the same way that he does. Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, verse 48, therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now that doesn't mean that we're going to become perfect physically, that we're not going to uh, you know, become that perfect being that he is. What Jesus means by this is that we are to become morally perfect because that is the only way that we can really reflect perfection as it is in the Lord. That is the standard, even though we're not necessarily going to attain it. Now again, getting back to the point, one of these holy perfections is the ability to show mercy, to be merciful. God is merciful. We saw that in Psalm 145, verses 8 through 9, where David writes, The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great in loving kindness. The Lord is good to all, and his mercies are over all his works. Now, what does that look like as far as, uh, you know, uh, men are concerned, as far as people? Well, this morning our Lord Jesus gave us the perfect example of this in his merciful forgiveness of the woman who was caught in adultery. This is the example that we are to follow if there is one who is repenting, we should forgive. And we're going to see that even if they're not, we should still care about them. You see, Jesus, this is the image that, that you know, it is his image that we are predestined to bear, which is why he calls us to be merciful. Jesus bears the image of his Father, and Jesus says to us in Luke 6, 36, Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. So we are to reflect this perfection of God's holiness. We are to be merciful as he is merciful. But now we need to ask the question, what is mercy? What does it mean to be merciful? Now we often distinguish mercy 
from its, you know, we might say those things that, that are sort of in the same category, justice and, and grace. In this way, we say justice is giving somebody what they deserve, whether it's good or whether it's bad, you give them what they deserve. God is going to bring the righteous to heaven because that's what they deserve. And of course, we can only deserve that in Christ. But he's going to send the wicked to hell because that is what they deserve. That is justice. And of course, when he gives us uh, the righteousness of Jesus that allows us into heaven, that is grace. But once we have that, that, um, you know, that perfect righteousness of Jesus, then it's just for God to, to bring us to heaven. That's what we call justification. Grace is giving something, someone good who deserves the opposite. We deserve hell. But when we trust in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, he gives us what his son deserves. He gives us heaven. So grace is giving us something good that we don't deserve when we actually deserve the opposite. And then mercy, we say, is not giving something to someone that they do deserve, and that would be a negative thing. It's not a mercy to withhold something that somebody's earned, if it's a good thing, but it's a mercy to withhold judgment or retribution if what they deserve, you know, what they've done deserves that. When you have the chance to get even with someone who did something wrong to you and you don't do it, but you overlook it, that's being merciful. David had the chance to kill Saul twice, a man who had tried to kill him on, on numerous occasions. But when he fell into, by God's plan, into David's hands, David spared him. He spared him when he came into his camp and Saul was sleeping. He spared him when Saul went into the cave and didn't know that David was there. David could have killed him both times, but he spared him. But, you know, I think what we're talking about this evening is, you know, it appears to be even a little bit more than just not doling out retribution, okay? Okay. It's more of a combination of mercy and grace. When Jesus says, you know, be merciful, uh, the word in the Greek actually means to show compassion. And I think that goes beyond just not doling out retribution or not, you know, seeking, as it were, revenge on somebody. It means to care about someone, even if they should be your enemy, the people, you know, you're least likely to care about. When the prodigal son returned to his father, asking his father to take him on as a hired hand because he was no longer worthy to be called his son, because he had wasted all of his father's wealth and his inheritance on loose living, his father felt compassion. He had mercy on him. He didn't turn him away. He didn't rebuke him for his wantonness because he could see that he was already repentant. He received him back thankfully placed his best robe on him, killed the fatted calf for him, and celebrated his return. He was merciful. He showed him compassion. When the Samaritan came across his enemy on the road, he didn't pass by on the other side like the Levite and the priest. He was concerned for him. He, he, he cared about what this man was going through. His heart went out to him. And so he bandaged up the man's wounds. He laid him on his donkey. He took him to an inn. He cared for him as long as he could. And then he paid the innkeeper to continue to care for him, promising that he would make up the difference if it turned out to cost him more. He showed him compassion. He showed him mercy. This morning we saw that Jesus didn't hand the woman who was taken in adultery over uh, to her accusers or call out for her execution. He had mercy on her. He forgave her. Now this is what the Lord wants us to do. He wants us to be merciful. He wants us to show compassion to others. He wants us particularly to do this to those who are our brothers and our sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, the example that I read uh, from Matthew 18 Peter is asking the question, how often should my brother sin against me and I forgive him? I think we need particularly to be merciful to those within the body of Christ. Uh, Paul writes in Ephesians 4, verses 31 through 32, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice 
Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Does that sound familiar? The Lord has forgiven you a great debt, and so you are to forgive others. But we're not only supposed to be merciful and compassionate to those who are brothers and sisters in Christ, the Lord says we are to do this even to our enemies, even as we saw in the case of the Good Samaritan as he reached out to his enemy, the Jew, and took care of him when the Jew's own people would not do that. The Lord says in Luke 6, 35 and 36, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and that is to your enemies, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. And so again, as those who have been forgiven a great debt, we are to forgive our brothers and sisters in the Lord, those who may be indebted to us for one reason or another. And it's not just monetarily, okay? And even those who are outside the body of Christ, our Heavenly Father is, is merciful. He's kind to ungrateful and evil men. He does good to them. And so Jesus says we are to love our enemies. We are to do good to them. We are to lend to them expecting nothing in return. And if we will, our reward will be great. And we will be sons of the Most High. In other words, we'll be reflecting His image. We will show that we truly are his children. So being merciful is more than just saying, okay, this person did something you know, bad to me. I had the chance to get even. I'm not going to do it. But it's actually caring about that person, showing compassion to that person, mercy to that person. And that's what we're going to uh, move on to in the, in the last point. What will the Lord do for us if we show mercy? Now let me just return to that, that other point that I mentioned. Maybe we should ask the question, first of all, what will he do to us if we don't show mercy? And I've already read several passages, and he's quite clear on this matter. This is not an option. Okay? It's not optional for us. This is something that we must do. The Lord says if we refuse to show mercy to others, he will not show mercy to us. And again, I remind you, Jesus teaches us in the Lord's Prayer. One of the petitions he teaches us to pray is this, forgive us our debts as we forgive others. Basically, we are asking God to forgive us in the same way that we forgive other people. Now, if we haven't forgiven those who have sinned against us, we're asking God not to forgive us. Does that make sense? I haven't forgiven anyone, Lord, so forgive me in the way that I've treated other people, the way I've forgiven them. Basically, don't forgive me. But that's not what we want. Now, if that wasn't clear enough, Jesus apparently didn't think it was because he actually adds those couple of verses at the end of the Lord's Prayer in verses 14 and 15, which we read for our meditation. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Remember what we saw in the parable that we read just earlier? When the Lord, uh, the King, calls the servant, he forgave the great debt to explain why he didn't forgive his fellow servant, the small debt. He pronounces this judgment in verses 33 to 35. He says, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. And then, of course, Jesus adds the words, My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Again, he says brother, so I think he's talking about within the body of Christ here. If you want to be forgiven, 
forgiving others is not optional. Now again, I've already answered this question, but let me ask you again to make sure that we understand. Is Jesus saying that the Father will not forgive you if you're not willing to forgive others? Um, yes, <laughs> that's what he's saying. But is he saying... <laughs> But is he saying that you're forgiving others is the grounds upon which God forgives you? Do you earn forgiveness by forgiving other people? Well, no, it, that's not the case. It is the evidence that he has forgiven your sins. If you are able to show mercy to others, you prove that you have received mercy from God. This is the way that, uh, that we understand this passage. Thomas Watson basically writes uh, and tells us the same thing. He says this, We need not climb up into heaven to see whether our sins are forgiven. Let us look into our hearts and see if we can forgive others. If we can, we need not doubt, but God has forgiven us. You see, the ability to forgive others is the evidence that God has had mercy upon us because remember when the Lord forgives us he doesn't just you know clean the slates that's not all that happens he gives us his Holy Spirit he gives us grace transforms us from the inside out to trust in Jesus and to turn from our sins and along with that package he gives us the ability to forgive others and that is the evidence to us that we are forgiven because we have the Spirit of God working within us and likewise, our unwillingness to forgive others shows us that God has not forgiven our sins. John Owen writes this, Our forgiving of others will not procure forgiveness for ourselves, but our not forgiving others proves that we ourselves are not forgiven. If you want God to be merciful to you, you do need to be merciful to others but to put this more accurately, if you want to know that God has been merciful to you, you must be able to show mercy to others. This, again, is, is not an optional thing. It has to be true of us if we are genuinely believers. Thomas Adams, who perhaps you recognize these quotes that are in your bulletin, writes this, He that demands mercy and shows none ruins the bridge over which he himself is to pass. And it's true. God's not going to show us mercy if we don't show mercy to others. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. God is gracious, he's, he's, gracious, he's compassionate. God delights in showing mercy. If he has shown his compassion to you, you also will be able to show that compassion to others. Not only will you be able to do it, but you actually will do it. And so the question this text asks you and me this evening is basically, is that what we are doing? Are we forgiving others? When somebody injures you, or offends you in some way, and, and again, we're reminded not only by Scripture, but also by our own experience, that happens frequently, doesn't it? And they come to us and they ask us for forgiveness. Do you forgive them? Do you forgive them when they ask forgiveness? I hope so, because if you don't forgive them, you're not forgiven. Now, what if they don't ask forgiveness? Is it in your heart to forgive them anyway? Do you want to be reconciled with them? Do you still care about them well the Lord tells us we need to what did Jesus do after he had been you know betrayed by his own people handed over to the Romans condemned uh, beaten humiliated nailed to a cross what did Jesus do did he call out in anger saying Lord destroy these hypocrites these religious hypocrites destroy them for what they've done no he prayed for them didn't he he said father forgive them they don't know what they're doing even though they had not repented and trusted in him. Now again, is that what you do? Is that the attitude that you have toward those who offend you even when they don't ask forgiveness, that you desire their repentance, you desire their well-being? Or do you hold a grudge against them? Do you write them off? 
Um, overlooking the wrongs that we suffer from others is perhaps one of the most difficult things that the Lord calls us to do, which is why we need a supernatural love to be able to do it. If you have his love in your heart, this is something you can do and something you will do. Listen to what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 6, talking about the supernatural love the Spirit of God creates in our souls. Love is patient. Love is kind and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Does not take into account a wrong suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness but rejoices with the truth. There's so many things in here that are applicable to what we've been looking at. Isn't it? I mean, we saw that we need to be humble, right? Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Well, the Lord says that we, we must be willing to show mercy, be compassionate to others, care about others. How can you do that if everything that they do or the things they do provoke you? If you take into account the wrongs you suffer at their hands, if Jesus had thought about all, and I'm sure he was fully aware of all they had just done to him on the cross, and yet he still prays for them this prayer of mercy. Lord, forgive them, by which he means, of course, bring them to repentance that they might be led to full forgiveness of sins through faith in his name because there's no forgiveness on any other grounds than that. He was praying for their repentance because there was a measure of, of concern and care for them even after what they had done to him. Love does not take into account a wrong suffered. So this is what Jesus did. The question is, is this what you're doing? I'm not saying you're doing it perfectly. And we all struggle with this. This isn't an easy thing to do. But is it in your heart to do it? Do you know it's right? Are you seeking to do it? When you see somebody that's offended you and, and they're in some kind of need, are you willing to meet that need? Remember what um, Paul says that we ought to be willing to do for our enemy. Um, not seek our own retribution, but rather leave it in the Lord's hands. He says, if your enemy is hungry, give him something to eat. Are you willing to do that? If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. Are you willing to do that? If they're in some kind of need, are you willing to help them? Are you praying for them? God forgive them. Lead them to repentance. Lead them to be reconciled with with you and, and with me. Is that your desire for them? Jesus says in Matthew 5, verses 44 through 47, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends his reign on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Jesus wants us to go beyond because he's given us the ability to go beyond what it is that the unconverted people do. Everyone loves those who love them, but Jesus says, love those who are your enemies. Pray for them. Do good to them. Desire their well-being because your heavenly Father basically is kind to them as well and he gives them good things. The sun is not just a symbol of good and the rain is a symbol of evil, but sun and rain are both good because they needed those things for their crops to grow. So God is good to all. We are to be good to all. Now, you're only going to be able to do this. You're only going to be able to do this if you have the Spirit of God in your heart. You're only going to be able to do this if you humble yourself. You're only going to be able to do this if you're firmly convinced that this is what God requires of you and that you are blessed if you do because it shows that God has forgiven you and that he will continue to forgive you and bless you even further and bring you to heaven and you'll be willing to do this because you know that this is the kind of person that the Lord can use. If you are merciless, 
If you're unwilling to forgive, if you're holding grudges and you're bitter, God's not going to be able to use you. He can only use those who are willing to forgive and who are willing to love their enemies. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. So let's bow in a few moments of silent prayer and let's ask the Lord to show us what's in our hearts. Whether we do have a heart of mercy or not, so whether we desire to show mercy or not, and whether there are those we should be showing mercy, but we're not, let's pray that the Lord would search our hearts and give us the grace that we need to repent of our sins, that we might receive his forgiveness and a greater grace to be able to do what the Lord calls us to do and to be what it is he calls us to be.